Hey, welcome to Dollar Views. I'm Brian Gillis. And I'm Stephen Maltmanex. We're just a couple of Long Beach State film grads with a lifelong passion for cinema trying to put our money where our mouths are. And we decided to make our BAs mean something by giving our take on the latest film releases. Plus, any other media we've ingested over the past week. Whether that's the latest Buzzworthy show. An album that's been on constant rotation. That indie darling no one can shut up about. A cute romantic comedy. Or the latest Michael Bay masterpiece. We go over it all. One dollar. At a time. How many times have you been in love? You're always the most beautiful woman in the room. Therese Bellavette. Carol. Tell me you know what you're doing. I never did. And then it changed. She's still my wife. I love her. I can't help you with that. shouldn't be like this. I know. This is yet another episode where I've seen almost nothing. Uh, blame it on the Oscars, really. Technically, you saw two new movies. I saw two new movies. I did one rewatch. But let's talk about the, I guess, the film that matters most, the one that came out last year, Todd Haynes' Carol, which you saw, what, like two months ago now? Yeah, like, I, I pretty much sort of forgot it on the spot. Well, I'm, I mean, it didn't make any sort of impression on me. Like, you know, I, I got it. I got the point, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I just thought it was really empty. I kind of agree with that. I mean, you go into this movie knowing that it's an awards contender, that it's a movie about a uh, early days gay romance. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone saw this without knowing that at some point, you know, there was going to be a love story between two women. Like, yeah. that is known. Yeah, like, there's, uh, no, doesn't have... there's no twist there or anything. Exactly. And it's a very straightforward movie. Like, it is gorgeous. You know, it's great period filmmaking, the cars, like that packer they're driving around, the the wardrobe, there's some really cool camera techniques, like some subtle framing going on, like there like there'll just be someone in the corner of the screen and then the rest is obscured, so you have to focus on them, like negative spacing. But I thought it like I agree with you, I thought it was like real lackluster, very by the numbers unoriginal just one of those movies that oh it's special because it's about a gay romance yeah i mean and it's it's funny like i keep thinking about it like because you know it's the end of the year I, this movie i i feel different towards it compared to brooklyn but for some reason like those mm. are the two that i just keep coming back to or i i think like they are weirdly good companion pieces probably because they both have a 50s setting Although yeah. one is obviously, you know, more of an uplifting, like, romance that you're rooting for, whereas the other mm -hmm. one's a tragedy, not because of the relationship, but because of the environment that they're in and how it's a forbidden relationship. That's what's weird, though. You don't really even feel that in Carol. Like, you, uh, like, don't get me wrong, I, I really, I, I was getting invested, like, their dynamic, but it kind of just felt like, oh, there's this experienced woman that goes around and she has had liaisons with several women she's experienced and then there's Rooney Mara who's never done this mm -hmm. and it you know she's flabbergasted by oh my god I, someone feels the same way I feel about them and it's not a man but it I don't but they're also they're having a relationship in a world or just in a society where you know it's it's yeah. very much against it like it is clear for both of them it's a secret like you know when they are caught that you know there's the hotel room moment i mean it's it's always a shock like you know they, like rooney mara clearly thinks that her life is over at that moment too for for several it's, factors that are going in it's a huge risk for both of them like you were talking about brooklyn a second ago for i didn't like that movie for some story reasons but i thought it was a great movie i didn't feel it deserved to be nominated for best picture yeah. a lot of people were mad that this got snubbed it got nominated for other things like set design and costumes um rooney mara and kate blanchett are both nominated i believe uh, but yeah, people are like, oh my god, I can't believe it didn't get nominated. Yeah, like, I mean, on a technical level, like, I just feel like both films are very similar. I mean, it's the 50s setting, uh -huh. uh, you know, it, I mean, even, I, I, I don't know, costumes and everything. Lead. Yeah, it, I don't know, it's just, they, they feel, I guess aesthetically, they, like, they at least feel very similar to me, other than the fact that one is shot digitally I, and one's on film, that's about it. I do like the world making in Brooklyn, the fact that there's a story there that's outside of the romances, and that there's there's something to gain from the experience. Like, you know, it, it's still a, a message that rings true for anyone that's uh, had the immigrant experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas Carol, you know, 
You haven't seen any other Todd Haynes works, have you? Well, no. I'm I'm actually going to see uh, Velvet Goldmine on Monday. Okay. So, and I don't well, know if we'll talk about it here. If you want to do it, that's a cinema. Yeah, we'll we, see. We can talk about it here. I think that's on HBO Go right now. So maybe I'll check it out too. All right. Um, but I really like the the superstar, the Karen Carpenter story. You have to find that. It's amazing. But this this felt like just like Far From Heaven for me. It has this. It could have been made in the '50s feel to it. Which, if you love 50 cinema, you know, that's a good thing. But for me, I was at a loss. I was like, cool. I saw Rooney Mara's tits again. You know, like, <laughs> I, I, it, it was kind of like a watered-down, Americanized version of Blue is the Warmest Color. Uh, which I haven't seen yet either. But I could I could totally see that. I mean, you know, this is, it's very, very, very slow. Um mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't see the subtleties, though, that other people are talking about. You know, there, there's a moment when just, like, brief glances are met and, you know, another character might not notice them. I mean, th- that to me, though, that's not subtlety. That's, uh, I mean, it's it's obvious. Maybe, I, I, I don't know what the good word for it, because I keep coming back to that screenwriting lesson of make your subtleties obvious. But that's just, like, it, you know, it, it's... It's not spoken about, like, in your face, but it's clear what visual language is being communicated mm-hmm. to you. Like, there's no distinguishing what's happening. You know what I mean? I mean, and so I don't see the layers that people are talking about. It's just, I, I get what the message is. I, I you know, I, I get what this movie is, and it it really it really does just feel like that, uh, you know, gay Oscar movie for white, straight people. I, there's nothing wrong with the movie. It's It's good cinema. Like, my Letterboxd review says... I know it's a good movie. It's just not good enough for me, and that's all I can really say about it. Like, yeah. I didn't, I, I didn't really care for the characters. Like, I, I can understand the subtlety people are talking about because every time Rooney Mara, Mara's on screen, she kind of like just looks at something. She doesn't say a word, um, and the cast is great. But like, I don't. I still. It, it just seems like Oscar. It's just Oscar bait. Yeah. You know? like, like I still wouldn't call it subtle. Just I mean, even the glances though. It's it's just it's so clear what they communicate. Like there's just no mistaking it. I mean. It's so queer, what'd you say? Clear. Uh, Yeah, that's, sorry, that's the sound of an (laughs) airplane uh, right now. I am outdoors, and hopefully this, you know, this is the last time on this show that I will have to be doing this outdoors. Um, But, I mean, you know, I sort of wish that I got more dialogue out of it, too. Just maybe a few more, like, things about these characters that were spoken about directly. I don't know, maybe something like a relationship along the lines of something, you know, on a Judd Apatow level. Like, I feel like just for this kind of relationship in a movie, I would like to see that. I would like to see human beings more than just, you know, lost people that just seem to communicate with each other just in stares and are in lust of each other rather than getting to really know each other. Whereas Brooklyn is set in the 50s and it feels like it, it Maybe it's because it's shot digitally. It just feels like a modern film in the past. This feels like a film from the 50s. And I think that's part of the dialogue that's missing, them actually talking about their feelings, anything like that. It's just like, mm-hmm. oh, the, the, the code is intact, and you, you can kind of show sex, but not really, and definitely don't talk about it. Yeah. And it, It's a good movie. It looks great. I just I can't recommend it. Like if you are a fan of Todd Haynes' work, you like Rooney Mara or Kate Blanchett, or you just like seeing movies that are acclaimed, then sure you're not gonna lose anything from your watch. It is a pretty good two hours. Um, just I there's nothing new here. He meddled in things men should leave alone. Not the slightest clue. That's where the clues are. He wasn't leaving anything to chance. There must be a way back. <laughs> Okay, let's move on to something that is kind of new, at least for me. <laughs> uh, we, Steve wanted to do this as a Death to Cinema episode. I can totally understand why now. Uh, we both caught 1933's The Invisible Man, yep. Claude Rains, Universal Pictures. And just to let you know, it wasn't just new for you. It was new for about... I don't know, maybe a hundred or more people at the Alamo at Draft the House on Tuesday night. Yeah, uh, it, it was. I've seen this movie so many times, but fuck, is this a great theater movie? I mean, when you're watching it with bet. people that are just like really into. I mean, I just I completely it's underestimated it. Yeah, it's just it's so much fun, man. <laughs> it, it, I I can't imagine. You know, I mean, this is technically a universal horror film, but I just can't imagine people screaming at a baby carriage falling. Like, I mean, it. it but you know, <laughs> it happened at the, the same rails. time. Like, it's crazy. 
I can I when that was my thing last night when I was watching. I was like trying to imagine people in the theater screaming during these quote unquote moments of horror because yeah. you know this this is a lot this is 80 years ago yeah you know, like it's a dated movie um but the visual effects oh my god yeah. all of the the work with the invisibility I, I, no, I'm I don't know confused. I don't know how they did it and I don't want to read how it was done I'm sure that information I, is I out there I read some stuff yeah I, I don't want to know did, don't don't tell, tell me don't tell don't me tell you all right you know I'm You'll, gonna I'm gonna I don't know everything I just know the unwrapping how they did that um, like and it's they did like early days green screen James Whale came up with this concept uh-huh. where Claude Rains was wearing black velvet and then they had a black velvet background Man, like, you know, I, I thought that the details would be, like, pretty much more obvious, because I actually, I saw this on a 35mm print, and it was a really, was it, a good re- it was a really good looking print, too, it came directly from the mm-hmm. Universal Archive, so, I mean, aside from a few specs in there, I mean, like, you know, that obviously showed the age, yeah, it was a really good print, and no, I still can't fucking tell, <laughs> like, I, I yeah, it, yeah, it my, looks so my seamless. My digital copy didn't i mean my digital copy wasn't good it wasn't one of the remastered ones so uh, there was a good amount of grain and cigarette burns and some just dirt and yeah stuff. yeah i know that I, I think it added to to the experience <laughs> i mean i i also i have seen the um the blu-ray uh restoration that they mm-hmm. did on it it's also a really good looking transfer uh but i mean yeah the, it was really nice seeing this black and white print of a movie that was 80 years old that obviously has you know some uh some signs of age on it but still looked really good let's backtrack i really like claude rains i haven't seen him in a lot i've seen him in lawrence of arabia casablanca <laughs> and mr smith goes washington yeah yeah just seen, based on you have not seen uh the adventures of robin hood no oh, like, when I, I was looking at his filmography after i saw this last night, i was like i really got to see a lot of these movies dude he is awesome um, like, like i i have I, not I, seen like, the... like he teamed with errol flynn like three times like, i gotta <laughs> see those I have not seen um, any of the Vincent Price um, Invisible Man movies. Mm-hmm. I know that he's mainly the guy that's known for the role, but dude, just it, like, it's it's Claude Rains, man. <laughs> like he, they made five of these movies. The one directly after this is The Return of the Invisible Man. That's the one with Vincent Price. Um, then there's Invisible Woman that came out that same year in 1940, which is like a like a slapstick screwball comedy with the concept. And then they made two using the same guy. I think in like the the mid 50s. Uh, one is the re- I can't remember what the first one is like the Revenge of the Invisible Man and then it's the Invisible Agent which is like uh, I think that's it's actually like 43 or something it's like wartime propaganda mm-hmm. where it's like the 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 army please tell me it's an serum. Invisible Man going to fight the Nazis I think that's what it is oh, yeah. fuck yeah I want to see that right and and so you know I, I I'm doing this thing I want to go see all of these Universal horror movies before they reboot the franchise and this is the first one I've actually seen. And so I feel like I have to see James Whale's other two, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, before I continue on my path. But it's funny. It's like I worked at Universal Studios. I scared on their property for their Halloween event, and yet it took me this long to actually see any of their original franchise. Yeah, I mean, all you've seen is uh, James Whale's showboat, huh? Yeah. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. A, before this, I mean, <laughs> Completely different seen movie. of Frankenstein. You know, everyone has seen some Frankenstein or some Dracula. Like it's just in the subconscious. You know, like we reviewed the Monster Squad a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. That is based on the premise that you know who these characters are, not just these characters, but Universal's creation of them. Yeah, I mean, is, the, it's know, basically like, their image that defines what everyone's yeah. uh, just idea like maybe, of the, that these characters are. Maybe not Dracula, but definitely Frankenstein, the Visible Man, the Wolf Man. Uh, creature from the Black Lagoon. I disagree, though. Um, I'd say especially Dracula. I mean, Bella Lugosi. That's the so? that's the iconic image of Dracula. Yeah, I mean that I, that's aped in everything. Like, you could... Even Hotel Transylvania. You know, that's the Dracula they're going for. But I think Dracula is just so big. Like, take someone like me, for instance, or not even just Dracula, but just vampires in general are such a huge thing that maybe they might reference that film or, or that series of Bella Lugosi, but it's kind of its own thing, just in the same way that zombies are their own thing now. Like, how many people watch The Walking Dead on a weekly basis, yet have never seen uh, Night of the Living Dead? No, I, I, I believe that, but I think with at least every Dracula interpretation, maybe... I, don't, I have not seen the Francis Ford Coppola one in a long time, but I feel like there's at least mm-hmm. some sort of homage in the performance being paid. Um, actually, Probably. actually, you know what, well, I, I gotta... 
I gotta take that back a little bit because I don't think Dracula Untold uh, really really <laughs> counts. But but then again, no. I have not seen uh, that movie in its native tongue either, so I can't. Uh, but I, if I have to guess, I don't think it's anywhere near what uh, the Bela Lugosi role is supposed to be. It, it's funny because we're you're talking about you know I've never seen any of these Universal flicks. Um, you know, Dracula Untold is the first in their reboot series, which is funny because they made the first original crossover franchise. You know, they they made all these separate movies, a lot of them, like, Frankenstein Dracula had, like, four or five sequels, um, and then they made Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman, and, you know, the House of Dracula and House of Frankenstein, mm-hmm. and then they made their Abbott and Costello movies where they met, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Wolfman, and yeah. the like, Keystone Cops, and all of these other characters. So they did crossovers within crossovers, um, and now it's coming full circle almost you know, 70 years later that they're doing it again. It makes but, sense, uh, but at, at the same time, I feel like the way that they're doing it, it's, they're trying to do it the Marvel way, and that's the sense that I get of what well, everyone have to else compete, is doing. You know? they got to compete, but... They've never had a superhero franchise. They never bought those rights, and so they have to do something to make the money. They already make the money. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do like that at least they're going back to their origin. You know, they got big because of these films, and they're trying to get even bigger using them again, and they got the big names to back their, their ideas here. Um, yeah. But yeah, Claude Rains. But, but, I mean, also just adding on to that, like, yeah, it is interesting. I don't think it's going to be a repeat of the old stuff either. I mean, you know, they are going for the you know, the big Marvel machine here. So either it's going to, I'm mm-hmm. still skeptical of how that's going to turn out. Um, could be either great or horrible, but yeah, Claude Rains, man. Um, he's so good. This is his first starring enough. role. Yeah. This is his first talking picture. He's in one sound before this. He was known uh, as a theater actor. His, I guess his father was a famous British, uh, uh, stage actor, but he's so good. Even though he technically doesn't have screen presence cause he's invisible. Wow! But just that like, voice, I mean, like, he's just having so much fun chewing that scenery, and even with all the rapping under him, like, there's just so much mm-hmm. being emoted through that, it's, like, it's just a ton of fun, you know, and it's it's not just him, too, I mean, like, some of the supporting uh, roles, I mean, Gloria Stewart, you know, she's no Faye Ray, but that scream, man, um, it, like, it, it's funny, you just have to be in a theater and hear that scream and hear people reacting to that scream, it's... It's so fucking awesome. But the one where she like puts her head down on the couch, huh? Something about that, or which scream? Oh no, no, no! Just in general, when she's uh, like you know just throwing like silverware around and freaking out, like when she's yelling in the tavern. She's a weird one in the wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking Gloria about Stewart. the I'm talking about the barmaid. Yeah, yeah, that's not Gloria Stewart. No, um, Gloria Stewart is the blonde love interest. Okay, f- well then, shit. What name am I thinking of? Because I know that I know the screaming yeah, uh, I, woman. Like I I've, I've seen her in a bunch yeah, of stuff. Yeah, she's weird. Yeah, I, okay. Now, I, I that's was my gonna. Bad. Gloria Stewart's the blonde. Uh, fun fact: she is old Rose in Titanic. Um, I actually, I have like, I don't know if it's true. You know, it's one of those things where like your family has a story and you can't really verify it, but you take them at their word. Apparently, my maternal great grandmother was friends with Gloria Stewart, and because of that, my maternal grandmother was named after her. Her name was Gloria. Um, and so she always talk about it. It's like, oh, like in Titanic, when you see Rose's pictures on the nightstand, like one of those, your great grandmother's in it, but she's cut out of the photo because of Hollywood um, and stuff like that. And there is some credence here. I think it's true because Gloria Stewart grew up in Santa Monica. I know for a fact that that's where my grandmother was raised. But yeah, this was like my first time seeing her in her heyday because prior to this, the only thing I'd seen was Titanic. Uh, no, that, that's cool, man. I mean, either way, that's a good story. It's pretty cool. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, like I, I don't know if her chemistry with Claude Rains is that great, but just him, yeah, just I, him alone, just him being invisible, and it's like right before we recorded, you were like talking, like singing some of the nursery rhymes <laughs> as a test. Here we go gathering nuts in May, nuts in May, nuts in May. Here we go gathering nuts in May on a cold and frosty morning. Whoops! It's so weird how he's. He's able to, at one moment, be really funny and being, like, just a, 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 to- a terror in the town, right? And just fucking everything up. And then the next, he's being, like, 100% scary, throwing things at walls and, like, I'm going to strangle you. I got really <laughs> strong hands. Like, don't underestimate me. And you're like, wow, that th- this is a complete 180. Like, you totally buy into the fact that this... Uh, you know what he's done to himself literally is making him crazy like yeah. the performance he gives is so good that 
you believe he is a monster. Like he's just having like, it's not... so much fun. Just uh, yeah. I, I mean, just the fucking. It's ridiculous the things that he does. You know, just grabbing one guy by the legs and then just like twirling him around, mm. like having fun. But I, I still can't get over the fact that people thought this was scary. Apparently. Well, I mean, also the fact that the like half the movie he's naked. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about that the whole time I watch him. Like he makes you know references. Like oh, it's like really cold. You have a warm rug. Yeah. Like, he he says once or twice he's naked, but I'm just thinking it's like. What's it like to ride a bike naked? You know, like, what wh- what's it like to to strangle someone knowing like your dick's hanging out? That's probably the main thing that people were thinking of when they were like just thinking, oh god, a new a nude man's attacking, and that's creeping them out. <laughs> yeah, streakers are but horrifying, yeah, the man. Funny movie, scary. Like now, you know, not an ounce of it is scary. No, but it's still standards. it's still really fun entertainment. I mean, especially with an They're, audience, yeah. man. It it really does come down to that performance. Like, I guess you know, aside from me loving that uh, that barmaid scream. Yeah, the performances are very, very 30s, um, and and they're in service of the plot. You know, everyone's a type, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it uh, really is just Claude Rain's performance that just elevates and just transcends all the typical, you know, stuff. Like, I, I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's typical like universal type of plot exposition and whatnot. Like, very one note. You know, like I'm not that big a fan of the Bell Lugosi uh, Dracula. Like, I, for historical reasons and atmosphere, yeah, it's got some nice imagery, but it's it's a pretty dull and slow movie. And I think Claude Rains just injects so much energy behind this that it just it makes it just so much fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, after watching this, I was even more excited for Johnny Depp's casting because I can see him doing a very similar type of thing, and I think it would be in reverence, not as a, a ripoff. Because Claude Rains, you know, never uh, redid the role. You, you know, him pretty famous. He's like the most famous A-list co-star. Like he never mm. really starred in anything besides this. No, he's an um, actor. Yeah, like an actor's actor. Yeah. But can you imagine someone having their first role, let alone their first starring role, and having this kind of like power? No one's first film is this good anymore. And like I said, like he was a theater actor, he had lots of experience. I'm sure that but there yeah, are examples like, out there. Um, just yeah, none are coming to mind though right now. Though, so yeah, I, I mean, I it is very much a like rare thing. Jennifer Lawrence and Winter's Bone, or, or you know, like there's like. Well, like, she acted subtle, in other I mean, stuff before. Like she was exactly. On, uh, yeah, like yeah. she was in a couple of things in commercials and whatnot. But like this is literally besides that silent film in Britain that he had like a five minutes in or whatever. Like, his first movie, and it was a huge movie. Like, it, it started a franchise, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, they had an H.G. Wells novel that it was adapted from, so that gave some name recognition, but that goes for all of Universal's horror characters at the time, all their monsters. But there's just something really great here that James Whale does, and I definitely, like I said, I'm going to see the rest of these monster movies, but I want to see a lot of his films. Like, I was looking up, he made... Uh, it was like the year after The Thin Man came out, so I think it's like 42 or 41. It's called What Happened Last Night, I believe. Um, it was originally called like Hangover Who Done It or something like that. And the concept is some guys got really drunk, they're hanging out, and one of them dies, and they try to piece together who did it. That sounds amazing. That I sounds have like to an Agatha Christie premise. Not even. It sounds like The Hangover, but better. You know? <laughs> like. There's actual stakes here. Not oh, we can't find our friend. So like I was no, reading no, that. It like, sounds this like fun could though. Yeah. Totally be remade. Like this could be made today. So I have to see that movie. Hopefully it's good. Well, I mean, um, with the trend of a bunch of uh, murder mysteries coming about, then yeah, maybe you got might get your chance. Maybe I'll yeah. Maybe I'll write that movie. Maybe they'll hell yeah. It. Do it. Uh, Just do yeah, it. I, I screen, would... Sell your screenplay. Have it put on the blacklist. <laughs> I mean, come on, do it. Spec. There's no reason not to. Spec script. Um, despite this movie not being scary, even though it's classified as horror. I have to buy this for a dollar. Absolutely. It's it, it just, it's so much fun. It definitely is a classic for the right reasons, and it's because of Claude Rain. So if you like him as much as I do and you haven't seen a lot of his work, you have to see this movie just just for his performance. It's basically like a, a radio play, really, when you come <laughs> down to it, um, with some really cool special effects. I'm right there with you. I've seen this movie so many times, like, and now I think I've... I've peaked as far as the best experience of watching it being in a theater with an audience. So if you ever, ever, ever get the chance to see it that way, or if that's going to be our first time, do it. It, it is a lot of fun. Uh, you saw another horror film at the Alamo Draft House this week, correct? Uh, well, yeah. Um, not exactly, but uh, you know what? Jumping three years in from 1933 into 1936, 
I saw Fury, which is Fritz Lang's first American debut after he left Nazi Germany because he didn't want to uh, be in charge of making uh, in charge of making films after having that meeting with mm-hmm. Goebbels. But yeah, I I guess I should have known what this was gonna be because this is a social issue film that you know directly deals with mob mentality and. Uh, you know, being a cautionary tale on vengeance. Um, it's very much a product of its time, and it's not the first film to ever tell, you know, this kind of story. I mean, but but it's not really, like, one of the best examples either. You know, I mean, this is basically a PSA. It's all very much... movies are like that. Yeah, it, it's all very much on the surface. There's no real characterization, nothing deep, or really anything just that simple. It's just all in service of the message, and... I, I mean, yeah, the plot services the message just fine. You know, the movie has a clear agenda, and it's not bad. Um, it's just, I guess, Spencer Tracy's motive. Like, what this is is that here's he plays this guy that, you know, is in love with this girl, and he's going to get married, and they're separated for some time, and, you know, he's saving up money so that they can get have a place and get married, and then the weekend that he's and finally going to... someone gonna, kills her. No, then the weekend that he's going to finally yeah. go up and see her, he stopped at a checkpoint, and it just so happens that there's enough evidence pointing him to um, being in charge of this uh, this kidnapping and taking the money from the kidnapping, and apparently he has one of the notes that's connected to it, even though he doesn't have the money. So then gossip gets around the town that he was the guy that did it, and a whole mob forms, and then they start trying to burn down the police station. So then they assume that he's dead, and basically it goes to court that this whole town is responsible for, you know, lynching. And so it goes to trial, and then... Boring. Yeah, and then basically Spencer Tracy just kind of goes crazy and sits back and lets it happen, and he's just going like, I tried doing it the nice way, but they wouldn't believe me. So... I mean, yeah, you know, it's it's a very abrupt shift, even though it's it's understandable. The way that it just happens, though, is really um, j- just just really off. I mean, but I can make the excuse that it's a product of, it, of its time. I think overall, it's it's a fine movie. I mean, in some ways, it's still relevant, but uh, it is quite dated. Want me to shock you? What? I've never seen a Fritz Lang movie. Uh, yes, you have. You've seen Metropolis, haven't you? Nope. You've haven't seen Metropolis, haven't seen M, haven't seen Red Balloon, haven't seen anything. All right, well, this is not really the one to start, actually, because, I mean, you know, even though this is his first film in the U.S., it really does feel more like it's one for the studio. And, I mean, who can blame him? It was tough for him to get work right after he fled. I thought it was okay. I mean, I will recommend it as a slice of history, but, uh, you know, it's not something I will be seeing again, but... uh, you know, I, I, it was another one of those things where it was actually nice to get to see it in a theater on a on a really nice looking thirty five millimeter print as well. I don't know what the source of it was, but it was um, it, it was pretty good quality, so there was that. But uh, the other movie, the better one that I saw, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which I didn't know was a Japanese production. Um, I'm gonna butcher the guy's okay. name, uh, Nagisa Oshima. Uh, it, it's also one of those movies that I just knew for years was on the Criterion Collection. I think I had it in my Netflix, my Netflix queue a couple times, and I just never, ever got around to it. Like, do you, have you heard of this movie? No. I mean, remember last week you you were saying, like, oh, have you heard of this? You want to do an episode for this? I was uh-huh. like, that sounds like a, a, a like a Frank Capra movie. I didn't you know, look <laughs> it up. David Bowie's in it, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's, uh, even though he's not really the main character, um, I don't think he is the main star that's being headlined, and he probably has the most interesting character in the movie, or at least uh, one that a general audience would find more interesting. I mean, he's definitely fascinating to watch and plays it well, but this is about mm-hmm. uh, British POWs in a Japanese camp, and it's... Uh, it's really it's kind of centering around four characters getting equal value it's two english prisoners or actually one is technically a new zealander which is david bowie and then there's two japanese officers here's what i like about it is that it's not a traditional pow flick you know it's it's not about escaping prison it's just about these guys like all of them including the uh officers and just them kind of being accustomed to their situation and just getting by with it and really so it's, it's just a teleplay no no no, not really it takes place over quite a long amount of time it's it's mainly just about cultural differences you know between uh, the english and uh, the japanese just having to deal with pride shame duty you know reasons for fighting it, like it all takes place in 
in you know, one setting, basically, and people yeah. come into play and they leave. Yeah, it sounds like a play. Well, no, no, no. Be, well, there's more. Th- th- not, not exactly. It's not like a one room setting or anything. They're just all at this camp, and you because there's four different characters. It's not like they're all interacting at the same time. Uh, and I mean, you really do get like different things in there. Like you know, you get the English reaction to uh, you know Japanese customs, like you know harakiri or. I mean, you know, even then, like, there was that, uh, the the Japanese officers do ask, like, why did you just let yourself be captured? Why didn't you just go sacrifice yourself or like that? They they couldn't do kamikaze because they were in the air, but, you know, you you get my meaning, like, do something along the lines of harakiri. Um, I, it's, the movie, here's the thing, is, I I guess it's tough for me to describe because it's, I, I, you might get the sense of it, me talking about it right now, because it's really good, but... I think it's a bit uneven, mainly just because these guys are all so different that, honestly, like, they're all great characters to watch, but they all can be in their own movie, and, uh, Hmm. I mean, it's, it's, I guess it's a minor complaint because it really is interesting seeing how these differences interact, but it's, it really is just kind of a bit jarring. I mean, especially, you know, with David Bowie, like, there are flashback sequences with his character that... I mean, while they are they are good and interesting in their own right, they're kind of they are important to his character, but they feel like they're just there because he's headlining the movie, and audiences want to see more of him, and it makes him seem more important. Even though, you know, he's not even the lead; like, he's not even the titular character of the movie. Mr. Lawrence is the other English guy. Um, so, I mean, it, it is kind of weird. I I don't know. I mean, I I do think I will revisit this uh, someday. Like, because I I. I think it's really good and it's definitely worth checking out and I I feel like I could still get more out of it on a later viewing somewhere down the road but um you know here's here's another thing that is just weird about I, I'm not sure how seriously I'm supposed to take this movie is like I mean there is a great 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 musical uh, theme for this movie and I don't know what it says when I mean you know first off I did sit through the credits just to listen to the rest of the theme but also because it's the Alamo Draft House when you have center seats and you got counters in front of you it's kind of hard to get out unless you wait for everybody to leave but like I was just listening to that theme and when I was walking out to the theater like just going back to my room like I was I just had it playing in my head and I felt good and it's I mean, even though the movie ends on a sort of positive note, I don't know what it says that a (laughs) P.O.W. Yeah, like, I don't know what to call it. It's such a good piece of music, but, like, I mean, out of context, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, Is it a Bowie song? uh, No, 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 it's it's part of the score. He didn't do the music of this movie. Like I said, it's a a Japanese production. Um, One of, God, I, I I don't have the name in front of me, but one of the... One of the guys that plays the British officers is also a musician. Um, and it's not, um, it's not, uh, God, I'm blanking on the uh, uh, guy's name too. Um, okay, there, there's one, there's one uh, officer that's played by the guy that was the school teacher in Battle Royale. And I, I know his last name is Katano or his first name because, you know, it's, it's in reverse in Japan. But, um, or, I, no, 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 it's his last name. They just say it first. But uh, it's the guy that's not him who is also the composer for this movie, I'm pretty sure. But, uh, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I do recommend it. Um, I wouldn't pitch it as a David Bowie movie specifically, but, you know, it is nice, uh, you know, seeing him in movies. I mean, I've seen two uh, so far that he can act in as part of this month-long tribute series, um, and I've seen The Man Who Fell to Earth before. But, I mean, yeah, the guy's a good actor, you know. Um yeah. He might seem a bit misplaced here because I do think you can't help but David not Bowie. see David <laughs> Bowie, especially in like some key key scenes. Um, but it, it, it's it's kind of I don't know. I I think it is just kind of a weirdly uneven but very interesting movie, regardless. And I I do want to at least give it another shot at some point down the line. I mean, I haven't seen this thing, but when you have someone with that much star power and charisma in a small movie it would obviously kind of make it unbound just because part of you is like oh i'm gonna watch him in every scene not only because of his untimely passing but just because you know like he mm-hmm. has that attribute to him even when he's not you know performing music but uh, the thing the is yeah, I, I don't two think different he's... colored eyes for god's sake <laughs> yeah um but i don't even think he's the best uh part of the movie i mean i think his character is the most rebellious one which is much it's by na- its nature is kind of interesting to watch but you know i mean tom Condy's performance in this too like as mr lawrence you know is also really good i mean i was far more interested by the japanese officers just trying to get an understanding of the english way or just what what isn't their way i mean you know they're both 
kind of that sounds both sides like are kind of confused. Yeah, but both sides are sort of confused as to like why they're even fighting the war, you know, which is not something in Last Samurai. Last Samurai, it's clear what the uh, enemy is, and uh, I, I mean, that's yeah, basically yeah. colonialism, right? No, I mean, or, not I, I've not seen the Last Samurai I mean, in forever. No, no, the Last Samurai is about the Japanese government, basically. Well, it's not government, but the emperor decreeing or like his advisors decreeing that this the samurai way of living has to end like they're trying <laughs> to be, become a first world power they're trying to get a real army with guns and so they hire tom cruise among other people to train the new uh, imperial army a classic um, hollywood then, whitewashing which by the whatever. way did you did you see that the uh, thing on last week tonight no the how is I, this I still do know thing? that was their their main segment that was funny yeah they were like and a white guy's the last samurai really tom oh, yeah. cruise oh, is yeah. the last samurai and then they show I think clips they made from like that joke risky on business. That show before. I mean, it, it, it it's a good joke though. I mean, you can't blame them, even though it's a good movie too. I, I guess, but like that's not exactly what the. I mean, yes, like in the sense of the movie, he is the last samurai, but it's <laughs> not about that. It's about him being the the vehicle for us being able to engage with this world. But they like, do have, you have a point. To have a, yeah, but it's I mean, a you different have to have issue. a white actor, this fish out of water thing becoming one of them, like the prisoner becoming part of the people that were, were trying to imprison right. him. Yeah, Dances now, I love that movie, or Avatar, so. yeah. No, I, I want to see that it's movie It's more, again, though, because the difference between Avatar... Oh, I, I still haven't seen Dances with Wolves, but between Avatar and The Last Samurai of Sides being a very similar story is that, like, what's-his-name in the wheelchair isn't trying to actually learn anything from these people. He's, they're just trying to find a way to get the unobtainium. Like, Tom Cruise is a prisoner just because he is, you know? Like, he, there's no technological means. Mm-hmm. He, he's trying to figure out for so much of it, like, why am I here? Why haven't they killed me? Why aren't they, like, trading me in for, like, samurai swords or whatever? I don't know. It's an emotional movie. The longer you watch <laughs> it, the more, you, at least for me anyway, and some, some of my friends, it's like you get invested in not only his character but the world that's going around them. Because, like I said, like, to, to see the samurai at the end of... Like, I mean, this was... This story takes place, like when the Visible Man was being filmed. Okay, but whatever. This episode wasn't. Wait, isn't Custer about that. was still alive then. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, like mm. the, the film because it's at. I think it's right after World War One when the film takes place because Tom Cruise was like a a hero or like a, a mythicized uh, figure from the Civil War. I believe it was, or maybe it was French. In it. I think it's Civil War. That, um, yeah, so that's he, the thing, is that The Invisible Man was shot way after the Civil War. I mean, no, but I'm saying, like, the story, like, Tom, this is, I think it's, like, 15 years after the Civil War, so it's, like, 1910, okay, so, yeah, sure, 20 years. No, 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 15 Man. years after the Civil War, that's, like, 1880. Was it? Yeah, yeah, Civil know, War ended in, like, math. 1865. I want to, I do want to say The Last Samurai takes place in, like, ni- 19... Eight or something like that. Though, I've, I haven't seen have it certain, in forever, but I, I'm pretty sure they have it's certain technological means, like a Gatling gun and just you know guns in general that aren't single fire. I wish I, I could know. argue this with you, but I have not seen The Last Samurai in a long time, <laughs> so I, I got to get to that. It's turn of the, I believe it's turn of the 20th century is when the film takes place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so but, do you want to talk about Magic Mike? Kind of, yeah. Like, we don't exactly talk about rewatches, but well, you we can rewatch Invisible Man. I don't really have anything to add. Um, I think this was my... It was my second full rewatch. I, when I worked at AMC, I saw it that initial time. I went into the theater as many times as possible to catch certain sections. Like, I saw the whole Rome uh, set piece, like, twice. I saw the final number once or twice. I've seen clips on YouTube several times. I've listened to the episode we've done like three times or four times myself. <laughs> I still have, I don't even remember what I said. I got to check that out again. I wouldn't necessarily say that I was let down because the high points are very high still. Like that convenience store scene, the final uh, the whole uh, convention moment, um, some of the montages, that whole Rome sequence when like Donald Glover is, is rapping to the girl, um, <laughs> some of the conversations they have, these little moments are really great but because a lot of it is for lack of a better word boring um it does feel uneven on a second rewatch um i I still enjoyed it you know do you kind of regret putting it so high on your top 10 no 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 No? it's still one of my favorite movies of last year 
Um, like I, I gave it a three and a half. Like if I was doing dollar review scale, I'd probably give it like a 7.1, you know, like it's not an amazing movie, but it is still a very fun time. It is something you put this on. You cannot laugh and smile during certain moments. The catch is that when those moments aren't happening, the in-betweens aren't that good. Um, in particular, the opening, like until he does the dance when he's doing the, like the machine shop stuff. Like, those first four or five minutes, I was like, what the fuck am I watching? And then, after the dance, you have to wait, like, another ten minutes. And then, it's like, well, here's another ten. And, like, it's peaks and valleys. Instead of just being a border... It's not like Mad Max, where there's... It's always this good, and then it's really fucking good. This is... It's kind of eh. And then then it's, oh, wow, and then it's eh. I don't know. I think I might have said this, or I, I might have used the term "hangout movie" when I uh, when I reviewed it. Because I mean that yeah, it's a hangout. Like movie. yeah, and it's it's like I mean for those long so it, those long boring stretches, I feel like I mm-hmm. mean if you really love these characters that much, that wouldn't necessarily be that much of a problem. Problem is that those scenes with these characters, even if you do care about them, aren't good necessarily. Like in the first, besides like the the little moments that are good, the first thirty minutes or so when the group is trying to work things out, like you have this horrible stuff with Matt Bomer and uh, Channing Tatum trying to w- overlook their differences and trying to accept each other and apologize and whatever. That stuff is, like, really bad. Um, like, I know they, they look good, but, like, Channing Tatum, his actual dialogue in this movie isn't good either. Like, he's making those jokes with Amber Heard that I remembered I wasn't that big a fan of initially. They're just as bad as they were in the theater. The difference here is that I'm laughing alone instead of with some, like, single 50-year-old ladies. I'd still buy that for a dollar. Like, if you've never seen this movie, even if you haven't seen the the first Magic Mike, there's just something about it. It's a ton of fun. One of the funnier movies of 2015. Uh, one of the funner movies, even. And even still, those final 30 minutes or whatever it is, like, <laughs> leading up to and the climax itself, is just w- must-see filmmaking. Like, it, it is amazing. I, I wish I could forget the final 30 minutes of this movie and watch it for the first time again. Yeah, so but I, I I think, you know, you might have finally had the experience that's similar to what I had because I really wish I had the right crowd for this. I told you, I saw it alone in a theater. Yeah. So that definitely had a factor in, I, you know, I just couldn't help but look at it as a movie and it just didn't really do much for me. But then again, like, neither did the first one. You know, I, I thought it was an interesting look into that world, but it told a very generic story that I just couldn't invest in. So there really wasn't a gateway in the second one for me to dig. Like I said, the, this this movie's great. It's just, it's only when they're dancing. Yeah. If they're not dancing, it's pretty boring. But no, that's kind of The gas station for, scene is the highlight for me. That's the first highlight. That, like, pales in comparison to the ending. Um, but still, yeah, that scene is amazing. But this is kind of true for all dance movies. They never have a good story. There's never good dialogue. Like, all the step-up films besides the first one, it's like, oh, look, it's this is boring. I don't want to watch this. Oh, but fuck, they can dance well. And, like, even, you know, the Busby Berkeley stuff, like, kind of the same stuff, you know? They, I oh, think like, you should see I don't the really Red care Shoes for, at some point. I, I know I have to. <laughs> even um, though, yeah, but no, that's not a dancing movie that's in a similar league as this, for sure. You know, I mean, like, this and Step Up, those are romps, basically. They are yeah. all about the dancing on screen. It, you know, it's a dying genre. There aren't many dance films left. You know, there's sequences, um, but it, for some reason, I maybe it's because of reality TV stuff, like, so you think you can dance and dance with the stars and well, it's, I'm sure it's the MTV other... generation, right? Or VH1 or whatever the hell. Um, Not yet. well, it's past it's that because I mean you can just go like if you want to see good dancing, go on YouTube, type in hip hop dancing. You know, like. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's not something hard to see, whereas no, once upon a time... I, like, mm-hmm. there is something about seeing talented dancers working in sync with, you know, some really good filmmaking at the same time. You know, whether yeah, it's the way that some's like, edited or the way that the camera moves. I mean, you know, that's... There's still... I, I don't know what stuff is on YouTube, but, I mean, yeah, you can make it, like, look cinematic in, in a way that, like, breathes so much life into... Like, you know, you really feel like every move because of the aesthetics, and it just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, once upon a time, the only way to see amazing dancing was on film unless you could afford tickets for something, you know? Yeah, that's and, true. But what I'm saying is now, you know, if you, uh, social media or TV or whatever, there isn't really a reason to do it on film, and then it's hard to even, you know, choreograph the stuff. There's only so many people out there that are good enough to, uh, to even... You know, if they're making a dancing movie, it's like, well, there's only like two people. It's like Kenny Ortega, or there's like one other people. It's like, 
that's it though you know there aren't there aren't many out there but i think the reason why our magic mike double xl episode is listened to so much or i don't know if it still is but the reason it has so many hits is because our conversation isn't about the movie we talk about the movie for about half the show uh, and another not much to is, talk about, yeah. Well, it's not because of that. It's just we have some really good talking points. So we oh, talk yeah. about why men are afraid to see movies such as these and the importance of the female gaze in cinema. And we talk about, like, the strong... It's called uh, Stromo by The Hollywood Reporter, the strong homo male report, uh, like performance and how men are willing to go gay for an audience and, and stuff like that. It's a good episode. If you've never listened to that, I'll, I'll link it in the description. It, it's a really interesting conversation. Keep pimping it out. You know, I'll take your word for it. Like, I I don't, I probably, I should really re-listen to that. It's been a long time enough now. I yeah, wonder I, what I thought. It, it is a good episode. I, I think it's one of our better dollar reviews. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, um, I know, like, you know, I've tried listening to some of the older stuff, and I know, you know, you didn't talk about this when you re, uh, re-watched Entourage. But when I saw that you put that on there, I went back and tried to re-listen to that episode just to see what it was I thought. Oh my god, were we dull, man. Like, we, we, were, so, we were so dull. I think we came a long way. Like, it, it just felt really hollow, like we were trying to go down a list and mention stuff. Or I, I don't know, at least well, to I mean, me. We, we did have lists back then, so... Yeah, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I feel like we've at least got a better, uh, better rapport now, at least. I don't think it's even just the rapport, it's just we've done so many episodes that we understand like we very rarely step on each other's toes like i remember back then like you would say something and then i would shout over you to get my voice heard like, <laughs> no you don't understand like um i, don't, so, I like, feel that, like that I, I definitely well i just did that just now like i, I don't know maybe uh, it's because we're over the phone and it feels weirder i don't um but i, I don't, I don't know i feel like is. i'm still doing that like back then though is what i'm saying yeah Origi- like at, in our early days uh we just we didn't have a real grasp on how to communicate without making our own voices the thing that we wanted to hear and we've we've just we we've got a better groove now yeah um, I, I th- I hope at least so. i would hope yeah, yeah if you I, think I, so I if think you've so. been listening if you guys have been listening for a while, if you heard the original Magic Mike episode before this one and, and you know you got something to say, let us know. The the outro is about to come up, but before it does, you know, it'd really help if you could leave a review or a comment on iTunes. Same goes for YouTube or wherever you listen to this, because uh, that really does motivate us to to keep content coming out. Thanks for listening. We hope it's been a pleasure. If you like this show and you want to hear more of our wonderful voices on a weekly basis, check out Two Cents, a recap of what's happened in film, TV, and tech news. We're also on Debt to Cinema, where one or both of us crosses a title off our list of shame. You can find all of our content at dollarreviews.net. Follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook at Dollar Reviews. We're available on iTunes, YouTube, TuneIn, Stitcher, and constantly looking to expand to other platforms. If you listen somewhere we're currently not available, You'd like to contribute some talking points, send a debt to cinema request, or if you just want to laugh at us, you can do so by reaching out to us on social media or send an email to brian at dollarreviews.net. Or you can email me as well, steve at dollarreviews.net. You can follow me personally on Twitter at Brian Gillis, that's B-R-Y-O-N-G-I-L-L-I-S, and now you know how to spell the email too, and also under the same name on the Love You site, Letterbox, which acts as my film diary, where I rate films that I'm watching, write the occasional review, and even sometimes compile lists. You can also find me on Twitter at S underscore MTX, and also follow my film diary at Letterbox under the same name, where I log everything I watch, and sometimes write brief reviews. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep the change.